Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, the topic we're going to be discussing is which hearing aids are right for me. Um, the purpose of this talk is to just give you some information, things that as a provider, I want to educate my patients about and tips um, that are really helpful to know before you go in to see um, a, a hearing professional and you're starting the process of thinking about amplification and a treatment plan that's best for you. So here's a little bit about myself. Um, I am Dr. Sinks uh, from the Center for Hearing and Speech. I have uh, been an audiologist for almost um, 20 years, and I've been with the center for about 10 and a half of those. Worked in various locations such as private practice, ENT groups, um, and things like that before I really settled in and, and found my calling here um, in a nonprofit uh, organization. The center is very special and very unique in that uh, we uh, believe in the right for everybody's access to communication. Um, and so we've been working very hard at this for almost 100 years. In fact, 2020 begins the celebration of our 100th uh, anniversary. Uh, and we have currently four locations where we are offering audiology services. Uh, our main clinic is in Rock Hill on Manchester Road. If anybody's familiar with the area, we're just down the street from Hacienda. We have a location um, in downtown St. Louis, uh, very near the city museum at the uh, Athenia Healthcare over on Biddle Street. We have a location down in South in Festus uh, at the Mercy Jefferson Hospital. And then we have a location in Creve Corps um, at the Covenant Place or the Mirror Woods Center. So the center as a whole um, has f essentially five different programs that we support. Audiology is one of them. We also have speech language. Uh, school screening program where we have uh, individuals that go out into the schools prior to them being shut down uh, and we would do hearing and vision screenings for the children on site at school. We have a hearing conservation uh, department and they work with manufacturing companies um, making sure that they are in compliance with OSHA regulations testing the employees and providing sound level meter monitoring, things like that. And then we have our connection that we just call senior connections. This is kind of new for us within the last year, but basically the initiative of this program is to uh, ensure that our St. Louis, uh, greater St. Louis area seniors are able to maintain um, the connection within uh, their communities, with their healthcare providers, with their family, um, and uh, so that they can uh, not become as isolated. So the whole uh, initiative of this project is to reduce the social isolation of seniors. And uh, we have several uh, subsets of that project. So here are some uh, four points of thought that we want uh, that we're going to talk about today a little bit more. Uh, some things that we want you to consider is where should you go because there are lots of options. Who are you going to see? Uh, will you have options in terms of the devices that are available to you? Uh, and is it the right treatment plan for you? Because uh, being a uh, taking care of your hearing is more than about just the device you are wearing. It is a full healthcare treatment program. And we want to ensure that our patients are getting all of their needs met. So private practice um, is one option. Uh, audiologists, just like physicians, uh, do own private practices. Some of the benefits of that is that you will more than likely have a one-to-one uh, -one relationship with your provider. Some people really enjoy that. 
often, you know, the environments are a little bit quieter because they're smaller offices. Um, and so uh, that is appealing to a lot of people. A hospital is another option. Um, audi- most of the, I should say, many of the major hospitals do have audiology departments in them. Of course, the benefits of that do include ha- uh, easier access to uh, a variety of healthcare providers. Downsize is a uh, downside to that type of environment is it can be very, very busy um, and often has rotating professionals. Community clinics, that's kind of what we consider ourselves here at the center. Um, we currently have three licensed doctors of audiology. Uh, we work with uh, pretty much the top seven manufacturers. Uh, and so we are able to offer our patients a full spectrum of products, everything from the most basic to the most sophisticated. Uh, and that's one of the nice things uh, about us, I would say, uh, compared to some of the dispensing practices where they may only use one or two companies. Um, dispensing offices is another option. And so a lot of times these are owned by, uh, sometimes they are owned actually by hearing aid companies themselves. Um, and they are often staffed by hearing instrument specialists. This can include places like Southwestern, Miracle Ear, uh, such as that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between an audiologist and a hearing instrument specialist a little bit later. And then, of course, you now have the option of big box stores. Um, and we'll talk again a little bit more uh, about just thoughts to take into consideration um, with these different locations. Okay, so who will you see um, when you go to your various uh, provider locations? Um, what is the difference between an audiologist, a hearing instrument specialist, and a technician? Uh, it may not be uh, intuitive, and if you haven't done any kind of research, you don't necessarily know, but it is very important that you understand the distinctions. So an audiologist is somebody that does have a bachelor's degree, often in some type of communication sciences, but in addition to that, we also have a four-year four year doctoral degree. Um, and during those four years, uh, we get a much more in-depth education, not only about the anatomy and physiology, um, about the ear, brain, cognition, um, but you have a much more rigorous uh, practical uh, experience. A hearing instrument specialist, um, in contrast to that, is somebody who they are required to have an associate's degree in hearing instrument sciences, um, but then mostly it's on the job training. They do have to pass a state exam to get a license. And then a hearing technician is somebody that's just kind of trained on the job. For licensures um, with an audiologist, there are state and national uh, licensure and certification requirements. For hearing instrument specialists, uh, there is a state license requirement, but national certification is optional. And then for hearing technician, they have a state certificate. With continuing education, that is something that's really important uh, for, uh, I believe it's very important just in terms of staying up to date with not only the technology available, but the research. Um, what do we know about the hearing system? What new information? Um, have we learned? And how can we use that information to help our patients? Uh, and so with an audiologist, we are required to get 20 hours per year, including uh, ethics, um, current medical research, and manufacturer development. A hearing instrument specialist gets 24 hours every two years, and there's no actual continuing education required for a technician. Okay, so will you have options um, in where you go? And sometimes this is a little bit more about uh, the big box stores, okay? So big box stores um, such as Walmart, Costco, Sam's, that's what I'm referring to when I say a big box store, okay? They will carry in-house brands, and I've got a couple of them listed there, like GHI, Liberty, Kirkland. Kirkland is Costco. Um, and 
in, individuals that go there are generally just fit with what they have in stock, okay? Um, they're not necessarily custom ordered to a, a particular uh, individual. Uh, Costco does carry, you will see that they carry a Resound, a Rexton, a Phonak. However, these are very different than the manufacturer products that are available to dispensing practices and audiologists. So they're typically one to two generations older than what we can obtain. They are de-featured, which basically means that the companies turn off certain options um, and make them not accessible. And the software um, is, is the software is proprietary so that it's locked and you can only receive services from the location where you got them. The downside to that is, of course, if you are unhappy with the service, you don't have the option of going somewhere else. OK. Um, Independent audiologists and dispensers, I mean, we're, we're not hindered by sales quotas. Um, we don't push particular products. One of the things that I always tell my patients is I am not here to sell you a hearing aid. I am here to improve your communication um, and quality of life. And that is my primary focus. If I have not done that, I'm not doing my job. Uh, so I think that's very important. Um, just coming from a healthcare perspective. And I think it's just something that everybody should take into consideration. Um, wherever you choose, uh, you just need to make sure you have the right fit for you. Okay. Um, so the right treatment plan. Um, and as I said before, uh, it's more than about what device you're wearing. It's really about your entire um, hearing health, hearing and communication health. So that includes things such as making sure you have an accurate assessment, making sure the uh, the operation of the devices has been verified, making sure you have rehabilitation options, and that you have access to a continuity of care. So how do you decide style, okay? Um, I should say, how, how do I decide what kind of hearing aid to get? We're gonna, we're gonna change focuses here just a little bit. So there are three things that I tell my patients to take into consideration when you're starting the journey of uh, looking at hearing aids. One is style, um, one is technology, and then the other, of course, is budget. So when it comes to style, you want to have something that is comfortable for you to wear, something that is easy for you to use, and something that is appropriate for your hearing loss. When it comes to technology, it really is more about what features are going to be helpful for your lifestyle needs. I can make a uh, simplistic hearing aid make fit a patient's needs. I can make a very sophisticated one make a pa fit a patient's needs, depending on what types of uh, environments they are in on a daily basis, okay? And so it's more about fitting to the lifestyle than fitting to the hearing loss, which is a common misconception. Um, and then of course, budget, uh, we've all got one. You have to have something that's feasible for you. So let's talk a little bit about the style options that are out there. Okay, so is this kind of what you think of when you think of hearing aids? If so, um, okay, this might be a little facetious, but uh, I thought it was a cute picture. And it is often something that people say, I don't want those things that are big satellite dishes on the side of my head, okay? Hearing aids have certainly come a very long way. These are some of the uh, historical styles that are out there. We have an ear horn. Um, here's our ear horn. Okay, this is circa, I believe, I believe this one was about 1848. We have our vacuum tube body aid. Uh, this is actually one we have in our display cabinet here at the center. That one was circa about 1948. And then these are actually bone conduction 
um, devices that were built into a pair of glasses back in the 50s. So if you see this little piece here, we would attach uh, an ear mold to that. And then this portion here was the actual hearing aid processor. So it was kind of interesting. They, they don't make those anymore. <laughs> um, but just a nod to our history. And so these are actually the current styles that are now available. And you can see we have everything from very small in the ear styles to our power users who do need the larger processors with the bigger amplifiers in them. Okay, so an IIC or an invisible in the canal um, is the, <clears throat> excuse me, it is the smallest um, in the ear style that is available on the market. It is really only appropriate for very mild hearing losses. Um, and so you can see in the picture here uh, that it just sits fairly deep in the ear canal. In fact, I would say that picture has it pulled out a little bit, probably more for viewing sake. The down limitations of this type of style is that there is no wireless features. Um, it does use a very small battery, and so you're having to change your battery in this about every four days. And obviously there's no um, user controls. This is uh, what we call a completely in the canal. It's just a slightly larger version of that IIC. Um, it does have some wireless features in it. When I say wireless features, I mean you can use things like our smartphones to control the hearing aids, um, possibly even use some uh, wireless accessories with it, and things like that. So that's what I mean when I say wireless features. Uh, it is appropriate for mild to moderate hearing losses. Uh, downsides can be because they do sit fairly deep in the ear. They are hot, a lot higher maintenance. Battery on this, you can get probably about five to maybe seven days out of that battery. Um, it's still a fairly small battery. Really not good for those with ha who have limited dexterity. An ITC, um, this is again, we're just kind of stepping up our sizes a little bit. So as you can see, we're now filling kind of the lower portion of the, uh, we call this the concha or the bowl of your ear. You can see that we do have some onboard um, controls now available on the devices. Uh, they are fully, fully featured with the wireless options. They do have what we call directional microphones on them. And our research has indicated that directional microphones really are the key to having better understanding in background noise. So a lot of the advertisements out there you will see talk about digital technology and, and how it can, um, you know, hear you, make you hear better in noise. Well, the, the digital filtering does certainly make uh, a difference compared to the analog that we had uh, years ago. But really the true benefit comes in when we have the ability to isolate the sound sources in front of us and behind us. And that's what the directional microphones do. So these are appropriate for anything from a mild to a moderate hearing loss. And you can get about seven to 10 days out of the batteries. Um, there are, there is one company um, currently who is making an in the ear style like this in a rechargeable option. It is only for the high end technology, but I imagine that it will trickle down to the uh, lower levels um, probably in the near future. This is the in the ear where we call it a full shell. And as you can kind of see, we're filling the full bowl of the ear here. Uh, again, fully featured for the wireless battery size, um, about more of a 12 to 14 day battery. This is a good option for my patients who want something um, that stays in the ear, but needs a little bit bigger uh, shell to hold on to for dexterity reasons. Um, again, as I said, uh, there is the option for one company at this moment who does a rechargeable uh, for this style. This is also a good option for individuals uh, who maybe are using oxygen 
Um, so it can get a little busy on top of the ear. If you have oxygen tubes, glasses, now we've got these masks, it's a lot of stuff to fit on one ear. Um, and so some people will elect to use an in-the-ear option when they have those oxygens and glasses and things. BTE, or behind the ear, um, as you can see, this is the device here. And then we have it attached to a custom ear mold right here. Okay, these are what we use for children. Um, because uh, of their growth rates. So we can replace out the custom ear mold piece without having to replace their hearing aids every six months when they hit their growth spurts. This is also what we, re what we recommend um, for our patients who have more severe to profound loss because they do have larger amplifiers. We can push more power. Uh, so that was, it's really the only appropriate option for them. But it can be fit on somebody with even a mild hearing loss. So in terms of the spectrum of versatility, this is the most versatile product. Uh, fully featured for wireless, of course, and it does come in rechargeable options now, which is really nice for patients that do have limited dexterity, vision issues, memory issues. Um, and so again, it's kind of probably the, one of the most versatile options out there can grow with you um, as, a, as a person and as your needs, uh, your needs for support increase and also grow with your hearing loss. This is what we call a receiver in the canal or a RIC, okay? Uh, it's kind of just the smaller, um, more discreet version of the BTE. So as you can see, there is still a portion that goes behind the ear here. But instead of having the custom earpiece uh, with a thicker tube, we have a very thin wire. Looks a lot like some of the Bluetooth pieces uh, that are out there. And uh, this is a very popular option. Okay, Fully featured for wireless, um, can actually uh, go straight to our smartphones. Um, rechargeable option is, uh, rechargeable is an option out there and uh, does have the directional microphones. So again, a, a very versatile um, type of style, uh, just a little bit in a smaller package. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about technology and, and how that works with hearing instruments. So as I mentioned, hearing aids come in everything from uh, a more simplistic uh, type of device to a, a very, very sophisticated one. And think of it really more as the brain of the device. Hearing aids nowadays are computers. Um, and so the most sophisticated hearing aids out there are actually capable of making for uh, a million decisions <laughs> per second, believe it or not. Um, and so they can be very, very, very complex. These are some examples of uh, lifestyle activities and what we would say is a guide, if you will, to figuring out what type of technology level is gonna be most helpful for your lifestyle. So in this private category, really kind of designed for those that live a quieter lifestyle, one-on-one -on -one conversations, uh, that type of thing maybe small groups, um, listening to a caregiver or a family member, that type of thing. Um, if you move up into the quiet lifestyle here, okay, so we have small family gatherings, quiet restaurants, all of these are Bluetooth, so we live in a technology world, so you do not have to get the most fancy hearing aids to get the Bluetooth features, okay, that um, I want to make sure everybody understands that because I've seen that used as a sales gimmick um, through some of the advertisements. When you move up into the active lifestyle, you know, this is uh, somebody who participates in situations where there's, you know, moderate levels of background noise. Maybe their environments fluctuate um, from day to day. So they could go any anywhere from they're going to the health club in the morning to then they got to go to the grocery store and they're going to watch their favorite TV show at night, um, that type of thing. And then, of course, we have our dynamic level. And these are people who are just very socially active, 
possibly still in the workforce, um, enjoy a variety of activities, everything from going to concerts uh, to listening to lectures. So uh, uh, they live a very versatile and dynamic lifestyle. Okay, these are just some snapshots um, of when we're talking about technology, um, what can we do as providers within the software? Because we said hearing aids are essentially computers now, okay? And so in the more basic devices, uh, we have some features that are open to us in the software, and in the very sophisticated ones, we have quite a bit more. Um, I'm not going to go over everything on this slide. This is just to give you uh, kind of a picture. All right. So, of course, with every hearing aid, we can adjust the um, volume levels, if you will, for soft, average, and loud sounds. And how much we can fine tune them depends on the number of handles here. Okay, so your more basic devices might have typically three or four handles. Your very sophisticated devices can have up to 24. And so how much can we really get in there? Almost think of it like those, those stereo equalizers. How many little handles do we have to play with where we can really shape the sound? Some of the devices are designed um, to be able to take the high frequency sounds that may be inaudible to a person. Maybe their loss has progressed to the point where they don't respond at those highest levels um, or they have a very steep slope to their hearing. And what we can do is we can take those higher pitch sounds that they simply cannot hear or maybe their brain cannot process very well and we actually shift them into a region where they have more usable hearing. And so that's something that we can do within this software. Uh, and this is available with certain products. We can control the amount of noise reduction in a hearing aid. Um, and so this is just kind of a screen showing you some of those features um, that we can control. We talked a little bit about those directional mics, so I can say how strong do I want those directional relationships to be? Do I want the hearing aid to look forward almost as if I'm looking at the point of a triangle? Do I want to open that up so that you can hear on the side? Um, do I want to set it up so that maybe I have a patient who's in a wheelchair and the person they're always talking to is behind them and they're pushing the wheelchair? Well, I can tell the hearing aid, hey, I need to focus backwards so that they can hear their caregiver. And so this is how we can control that. Um, we can also control uh, the amount of noise reduction uh, within a device. And so on your more basic end of devices, I might, it might be more of an on-off with the noise reduction. And in your very sophisticated, I might have different levels of noise control that I can pick from. This is kind of another option in, um, in how we control uh, for fine tuning. So let's say somebody comes back to me um, at a follow up appointment and they say, you know, I'm really hearing great. I'm doing a whole lot better with conversation, but the refrigerator kicking on is driving me nuts. Well, I can come into the software and I can pinpoint what I want to adjust without having to sacrifice speech. And I can tell them exactly what environmental options. All right, so some people will elect to have onboard controls with their hearing aids and other people will elect to put them in strictly an automatic mode. As we've already said, hearing aids are very smart these days. Even the, even the more basic level devices are quite intelligent. Um, and so they will sense what's going on around you and adapt for you. 
but some people like to maintain control over their instruments. And so within the software, we have the option of setting up exactly how much control, what do you want to control, um, such as a volume. Do you want to be able to change programs? How much of a range do I give you? Do I give you just a little bit of wiggle room? Or if somebody has more experience, do I want to give them a little bit more leeway? So this is, this is all about just how we set up those controls. And uh, that's really more to the patient's desire. Okay, apps. There are apps for hearing aids. <laughs> um, there's apps for everything. So, uh, so this is just a screenshot of some of the apps that are out there. You can see that we compare them to the uh, smartphones, iPhone or Android. Uh, many of the devices are now designed to go direct to the phone. You no longer have to have a middleman, such as a pendant, um, to wear that would communicate from the hearing aid to the pendant to the phone. Now they just go hearing aid to phone um, or tablet or laptop. <laughs> um, and so we have lots of options. Within these apps, you can do something as basic as turn up the volume to adjust the shape of the sound. There's often um, frequently asked questions in the apps. There's little video tutorials. With the Oticon On app, um, it, this is one of the more unique apps. Uh, and so with this device, you can set, uh, I believe they call them, uh, I call them recipes. <laughs> That's probably not Oticon's term for them. But you can set it up so that uh, your hearing aids communicate with your wireless devices in your house. Um, so you can get a signal when the washer and dryer goes off. Um, you can uh, s um, communicate with your, if you have smart lighting, um, it's home security systems. It can all be done through the app uh, and the hearing aids itself. So again, amazing things that hearing aids can do these days. Okay, we're going to shift gears just a little bit and we're going to talk more about what are some tips for effective communication skills because uh, keep in mind, again, we're talking about more, th more than about the device. The device is the hardware, okay? But really to have a complete uh, communication ability, we have to use the skills to communicate with each other, um, to facilitate the best opportunity. So one of the things I always try to educate my patients on is making sure that you set your stage, okay? Make sure the environment is optimal for communication. And that includes facing the person you're speaking to, ensuring that your um, face is in good lighting, because even though uh, most people don't have formal lip reading training, we get a lot of our information from visual cues, okay? Get the attention of the person you're speaking to first. Uh, I'm, I'm guilty of this as much as everybody else. Uh, so we talk to each other as we're walking through rooms. Um, we've got our backs turned. And so it's just human habit, okay? But if we can learn how to change some of those little habits, you would be surprised what a significant difference it makes in the overall satisfaction of our communication. If you have a person who um, is hard of hearing in the and you encounter them, um, or if you are the person who is hard of hearing, express the best way to facilitate the communication. Say, I need you to look at me when you speak. I need you to slow down just a little bit. Or if you're speaking to the person that's hard of hearing, what can I do to make this easier for you? Okay. If at all possible, if there is some type of visual reference to use, emphasize that. Getting the point across, you really don't need to shout. Okay. Especially if that person has hearing aids. Um, the hearing aid is taking care of the amplification. And if you shout on top of that, it can actually sound very distorted to a person. Um, so instead, speak clearly, 
um, at a moderate pace, if you pause just slightly between sentences, it gives the brain time to kind of catch up. Okay. I'm not saying you have to speak like this. Hi, how are you? That's not natural. Okay. But if you speak very quickly like this and they can't understand what you're saying, what chances do they have of understanding you? So speaking at a moderate rate, pause just fractionally at the end of a sentence and things will go much smoother. If they do not understand you or if you don't understand a person, ask them to rephrase the question. Um, this happens very often. Um, this happens very often uh, when I'm in the clinic and I'm speaking with friends or family members. And so I hear them say the same question over and over and over again. Okay. However, if they haven't gotten it the first two times, they're not going to get it. And so if you just change a single word or a slight turn of phrase, it often will engage the brain and make it so that you're understood. Make sure that you are patient with each other. We live in a very hectic world. We are often all very busy. Granted, things have slowed down a little bit <laughs> um, this year, um, but you know, often we're multitasking. And so if you are speaking to somebody who is hard of hearing and they seem to be a little bit slow to respond, give them some time. Chances are their brain just needs a little bit longer to process what you're saying, okay? Um, again, if you are in a group and there's somebody who is hard of hearing in your group, make sure you do address that person. Don't talk about them. Um, when they're directly there. So this is something I've encountered in my office. Again, I'll, I'll have a patient at my, um, uh, in the treatment room and they might come with a family member or caregiver and that caregiver uh, will look at me and say, just don't, don't bother talking to them. They, they can't understand anything you're saying. Um, just talk to me. Well, can you imagine how that makes the person feel? Okay, we want to ensure that we're showing them respect and helping them build confidence in their communication ability. Uh, and so always make sure that when you are talking to somebody who is hard of hearing, um, that you are addressing them and, and give them the opportunity to communicate for, on their own behalf. Okay, and I almost think this is probably one of the most important ones is we really have to maintain a sense of humor uh, my favorite story, and, and this goes back a number of years at this point, but I had a couple come into my office. Uh, the husband was the patient, came in with his wife, and on the day of their, uh, their appointment, it was their evaluation appointment, we were talking about what situations they've encountered together and what difficulties they've had. And he just stopped, and he looked over at his wife, and he says, you know, this really makes me think. The other day we were at our friend's house and the entire night you kept talking about your slippers and I didn't want to say anything at the time, but I just didn't, I don't understand what's with the slippers. Nobody cares about your slippers. And I could see the wife, she was, she was kind of holding in some laughter. Um, but she looked at me and she looked at him and she kind of leaned over to him and said, I was trying to tell you your zipper is down. Well, he, of course, got instantly red in the face, but then he just started laughing because if we can't laugh at ourselves, let's face it, life is going to be a whole lot harder. So maintain that sense of humor because misunderstandings are going to happen um, and we might as well make the best of it. So we've been talking about all these amazing things that hearing aids can do nowadays. And the reality is that we have to have expectations that are realistic because the hearing aids are not going to be repairing the hearing loss. They are a tool and they are a tool to help you facilitate communication. 
Okay, but we're not making the loss go away. So these are some realistic expectations that we uh, educate our patients with. Uh, your hearing aid should always be comfortable for you to wear for the entire day. If you're wearing something and, and you want to take them out after like two or three hours, you need to go back to your provider and discuss that with them. Okay. Hearing in quiet is always going to be easier than understanding in background noise. That's true of even people with normal hearing. All right. So just because you have hearing aids doesn't mean you're going to get Superman ears. All right. Uh, whistling or feedback. Um, it is normal for hearing aids to whistle or have that feedback sound as you're putting them in or taking them out. But once they're seated in your ears, you should not be hearing feedback. If you are, again, go back to your um, hearing uh, professional and, and uh, ask, tell them about that. One thing I always tell my patients is if you don't tell me that you're having a problem, I don't know and I can't help you. So always make sure that you have a person that you're comfortable expressing um, those needs with. Okay, so let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? Budget. You've all got one. We have to have something that's feasible. And so obviously we're not going to get too much into the, into the nitty gritty, but let's talk about some generalities, okay? These are some budget tips, things that um, I think are helpful for people to ask about um, when they're starting this process, okay? If you read an advertisement in the paper that seems to be too good to be true, they usually are, all right? Um, and a lot of times it's like a bait and switch technique. So they'll get you into the office with the advertisement and they'll say, oh, those, those aren't appropriate for you, so let's talk about these other ones, all right? So just watch those too good to be true advertisements. Um, when comparing prices between providers, make sure you ask about the exact models, not something that's similar or comparable because you wanna make sure you're comparing apples to apples, not apples to pineapples, okay? Um, ask of if their services are included with the initial offset uh, of the cost, or do you pay service fees each time you go into the office? That's something that's important to know, all right? What is the warranty? All devices will come with a warranty, all right? That warranty comes from the manufacturer. And so if you are going to a provider and they are using the national brands, that warranty stays with you regardless of the office you're receiving treatment from, all right? But just make sure you ask, how long is the warranty and what does it cover, all right? I have seen a lot of times advertisements that um, are talking about, you know, 30 day free trial um, and, the, and they're using that as a gimmick uh, for advertising. But I want to ensure everybody that in the states of Missouri and Illinois, there is a 30 day trial period, regardless of where you go, regardless of the brand that is there, that is state law that is there for your protection. Okay. So these are some um, options to, uh, to suit your needs when it comes to budgeting for the devices themselves. Uh, these are specific to the center, but I, uh, I um, with the exception of number five, ooh, with the exception of number five, uh, then uh, I imagine they're available to other locations as well. So you can do like a half down, half later. Uh, you know, at the center, we allow our patients to put down 50% of the total cost up front. They can pay the rest over 90 days. Um, and that is not like a financing. We just give them that courtesy. Okay. You can do fixed monthly payments. Uh, a lot of companies are now offering like a leasing option, similar to what we do with our smartphones. So you pay, you know, your monthly fee. Um, you do that over a period of three years is the typical leasing option. And so you keep making that monthly payment, but then you have the choice of trading in your hearing aids every three years for the latest technology. It's not for everybody, 
but is certainly appealing to uh, a certain group of individuals. Uh, check your health insurance benefits. So contact your carrier to determine if you have any benefits specifically for hearing aids. Be watchful of the fine print, okay? Many of them will require you to go to a specific provider um, or the benefits will only apply to one particular manufacturer or like a mail order device. So really look into the fine print of that. Uh, the mail order devices uh, are often the managed Medicare programs. So uh, you can get healthcare assistance loans. Um, these are often done through, uh, there's one called Show Me Loans in the state of Missouri. Um, we have a partnership uh, with a, uh, a local bank. And so these are loans at a very low interest rate, often much better than what you can get on a credit card. And they're specifically for healthcare needs. So that might be an option. Okay. Um, and then here at the center, because again, we are a nonprofit organization, we do offer uh, a sliding scale based on income. Um, and that can include copay assistance as well. So if you have health care benefits through your insurance, you could get financial assistance on the copay portion. Okay. Uh, so we uh, essentially will give a scholarship anywhere from 20 to 90 percent of the cost of the device itself based on the income level of the household if a person is working in school or attempting to find work of uh, vo uh, vocational rehabilitation might also be a resource and we work very closely with them they will buy devices um, if you meet their income criteria so at this point, um, during our live presentation, there would be an opportunity uh, for individuals to put questions into the chat box. But please feel free to contact us um, by email. Uh, my email address is sinksk, so it's S-I-N-K-S-K -S -S at C-H-S-S tl.org. Um, thank you very much, and um, uh, hopefully you learned something today.